So, Ryan Duns, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Um, we are going to be discussing your book, Spiritual Exercises for a Secular Age, Desmond and the Quest for God, which was published uh, in 2020 by Notre Dame Press, who I realized after uh, n- noting that down that I've been doing a, a lot of work, a lot of work around Notre Dame Press at the moment. So um, it's always it's always uh, interesting. Um, but before we jump in with these these ideas and, you know, spiritual exercises for a secular age, um, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how this book came about. Sure. Um, you know, James, thank you so much for having me. I am an assistant professor at Marquette University. I've been here now for four years. Um, I teach systematic theology of a variety of flavors. I am an ordained Jesuit priest. I was ordained in 2015, and I was ordained while I was doing my, my PhD at Boston College. The rough part of my life, I was born in Cleveland, Ohio. I entered the Society of Jesus in 2004. I lived and taught in Detroit, New York City, and for five years in Boston, where I did my theology studies for priesthood and then my doctoral degree. I was fortunate at Boston College because in 2012, Brian Robinette moved from St. Louis University to join BC's faculty. I had one, it was after the first day of the first class with Brian, we were moving furniture around the classroom. I said, hey, do you ever, have you ever heard of Rene Girard? And he perked up and said, I, I have a new interest in Girard. I said, oh, that's interesting. And then I pushed the waters, you know, tested the waters a bit more. And I said, hey, have you ever, have you ever heard of William Desmond? And he stopped what he was doing. And he said, I just spent my whole summer reading God in the Between. And from that moment on, I knew what St. Ignatius would say, like consolate, like a, a, a clear sign of consolation. This was my dissertation director. So I applied to one doctoral program, figuring I'd either get a PhD or be a really popular high school teacher. And I was accepted. And this project, the book, um, is a reflection of that, of, of, of that journey of reading Charles Taylor with Dominic Doyle and with Brian Robinette of studying philosophy with Richard Carney and l- learning about and then becoming friends with William Desmond himself. Uh, so it's a very, it's a, it's very, a very personal book in some ways. Uh, and I hope that that tone comes through for people. Mm-hmm. Um, I hope you don't mind if I ask, what was it that originally drew you to become a Jesuit? So for those who have Girardian ears, let them hear. The the Jesuits who taught me in high school, so from Cleveland, St. Ignatius High School in Cleveland, to a person, they were happy. Mm -hmm. And they had a credible happiness. It wasn't flippant. It seemed to have depth and sincerity. And they demonstrated to me the kind of, not the kind of man that I wanted to be. And as I grew older and came to know more and more Jesuits, uh, I found that they were willing to ask questions. They were men not unwilling to struggle with faith and ask hard questions. They were men who were comfortable being in the metaxu, the between of, of, of clear and easy answers. They liked the challenge. Then I think that skill of discernment so valued by Jesuits is something that I, I I was deeply formed by the, the need to engage in an ongoing discernment of what's moving on in my heart, but also what's moving on in my mind as I think through questions. Do you, do you think this book would have would have uh, appeared on the scene if, if, if you hadn't taken this path? No. It, 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 no, I don't think so. You know, it, it, the, the book is in a way deceptively titled. And I had one senior Jesuit who raised his eyebrows and like, and said, I thought you did philosophical theology, not spirituality. Hmm. Now you can, and Sandra Schneider's uh, now emerita at JST Berkeley would quibble with that type of dismissal, like spirituality can't be serious. But w- the notion of spiritual exercises was something that obviously I, I was introduced to through St. Ignatius and then came to Pierre Hadot who helped reframe the question and show me how deep and transformative its roots actually were. 
but I think it was I was sensitized to, to the idea of a text as performance of their performative capabilities as one who has studied and received the spiritual exercises and given the spiritual exercises in a, in a shorter eight day form. I think that that gave me a different hermeneutic lens through which to read Desmond's texts, to read Charles Taylor's texts, and to get a sense of maybe the deeper dynamism at play within them. So again, I think that it was this critical discernment uh, that had been fostered within me that enabled me to, to sort of recognize some, some movements in the texts that might otherwise have gone unnoticed. And it was so that that affective personal experience then refined through my engagement with Hado that helped me uh, really articulate the way I wanted to approach the project. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Well, before we um, before we do jump into the book, which is um, extremely expansive book, and it touches on it touches on so much. So it's going to be a uh, a very <laughs> A conversation, I imagine, full of digressions. But before we do so, I, do so, I have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, uh, living or dead, into a room and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? I would, I would love to put Charles Taylor, William Desmond, and Iris Murdoch. And of course, I, Desmond and Taylor, to my knowledge, engaged one time in Rome. Mm -hmm. And if, if you know, maybe I could, if I could modify that, I would like Murdoch because she was willing to think metaphysics without what we, what in some ways, would appear to be without God. And one can question the nature of her religiosity and the depth of her thought. And I think Paul Fittis in his new book uh, suggests she's not as atheistic as one might imagine, despite her own avowals and her. Uh, her, in her writing. But I think those are, they're three heroic thinkers who cut again, each one cuts against the grain in a really profound way. Taylor trying to re narrate, retell a tale, William Desmond recuperating metaphysics. I mean, it's not, I, I say in the book, and I, I take seriously when, when Desmond is dismissed or, or, or regarded as the last metaphysician and you think oh my god i'm writing about this guy is this the end of the road and murdoch who was pushing you know with those you know with midgley foot and anscombe these women pushing back against the dominant tropes of of mid-20th century philosophy moral philosophy you know I, I i think that they i would love to hear them talk about the good the nature of is it disenchantment are we bewitched uh the role of the ego in philosophy. I think Murdoch would have a field day looking at so much of contemporary philosophy as exemplifications and, and horrendous incarnations of the fat, relentless ego, uh, hence Twitter <laughs> or Instagram, you know, the cult of, of the self. But I think they, I think today eavesdropping in on their conversation would, would be heartening to hear really profound thinkers wrestling with really profound questions about who we are, our place in the cosmos, the meaning of life, and the way we can undergo a form of transformation by responding to this call, this woo, this magnetic lure of the good or of God or by grace. What, do you think there'd be any major clear disagreements in that room? I think the two, the one I, I, I start, I mean, it's, def, it's identified here in the book would be between how Taylor understands the nature of secular three or the nature of disenchantment? Is it, is it a process that's over and done that we live in a disenchanted world? Or is it more like Desmond would see it as that we've been bewitched and we can be re-roused to return to a sense of, of God once again? So I think there's the existential stance of is it, do we need new ways to experience this or can we repristinate the old milieu from whence we came? And then here you would have uh, Murdoch, I think rightly raising the question, well, do we need God at all? Can good provide a, and I say this in a small C way, so, uh, a Catholic understanding of, of morality that, that draws all humans towards itself? 
uh, something that displaces the ego, that rehabilitates the ego, that cultivate through cultivations of practices of attention, transforms the self, practices of the self or, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 what, what, what was it? Uh, Anthropotechnics uh, <laughs> by Sloterdijk. You know, are there these self undertaken practices of, of soul craft, I guess, self craft. Okay, well, that would be an interesting room. And it's a room that we most definitely will be uh, discussing throughout this conversation, I imagine, especially with uh, Desmond and Taylor. Um, but just to really open up the conversation, because it's such a difficult word, which I've uh, discussed with many people, um, you know, relating to your title, spiritual exercises for a secular age. And this is something we hear a lot, that uh, it's undoubtable that, you know, um, nations are becoming more secular, people's default position is one of agnosticism, if not a sort of a self-declared atheism. Uh, belief in God is uh, unfortunately... Um, you know, decreasing year in year out, as per the statistics, at least. Um, so, what, what do you, what do you mean by a secular age? So, I take, I take for granted Taylor's definition that in of, of secular, <coughs> secular three, as he describes it, as sort of the milieu where the question of God hasn't, the, the answer is not presumed either culturally or personally that it, it, it's contested, that there are multiplicity of options available. And you know, the more I think, you know, I think maybe I, I'm, I'm thinking out loud now, I think that I took maybe even Taylor too much for granted. He, you know, we, we, he'll talk about, um, you know, the plur, like a, the push and pull, the James, this form of Jamesian open space that can be experienced in this uh, secular three where there's so many options and people are almost paralyzed by choice. Mm. That there's no uh, clear, everything is up for grabs in, in, in secular three. Mm. Like we can, what to what do we commit ourselves to? What do we commit our freedom? What, what is it you mean by secular three? Sorry, for those. That oh, you know what? Let me like, if I can. I can pull this up in the book just because I've got it. Just for those who, who don't. Know. So it, 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 Taylor will talk about secular three focuses on conditions of belief. Belief in God has ceased to be axiomatic or presumed. Belief and unbelief are contested options. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 secular one, secular two, secular one. A classical view of secularity, wherein the sphere of the secular or earthly is separated from the sphere of the eternal. Mm. Public spheres, you know, public space is emptied of God or of any reference to ultimate reality. So, you know, high wall, church and state. You do churchy things over there. That's the God area. Then we have our own set off space. Secular two, a more modern view of secularity. Public space is regarded as neutral to religion and non-confessional. Secularity is more the falling off of religious belief and practice in people turning away from God and no longer belonging to the church. Okay, that's grand, but he, you know, I, I simply don't see that. Uh, so, you know, secular to uh, certainly, um, I think that's more what, what we find being tested, Ryan Burgess's book on the nuns or uh, Jerry Baggett, they're, they're really good archaeologists of what's going on with this group and i i don't think that people are any less religious in their practice they just said it, it's to what they have attached that, that practice to so, you know uh we have the oscars and the build-up that goes into the oscars the super bowl i mean we have national pageantry i go to marquette university basketball games and there is a ritual there's a lit a very very specified liturgy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there are very specified practices now what does that mean it, i think it does mean that we, there's a, a like a homo religiosus like there is something very deeply ingrained in us about being religious I don't know that the students I teach or the people I, I tend to work with are necessarily any less religious today than they were a long time ago, but they don't know to what they have, what, they don't have that backdrop of 
inherited beliefs and practices. So where our civic practices have stayed very stable in some ways, our religious ones have not, you know, people don't go to church. And so when you're dealing, you know, when you're teaching unchurched people, you're trying to get them to raise questions that they that just don't even occur to them to think about mm -hmm. the question of God, the question of belief. It just, it, it, it's, it's just not a live question. So like secular three is, is in a way a great way of thinking about the, the, the arena where we encounter people and try to provoke can we provoke the questions and get them to, to questions? What is the meaning and purpose of life? What gives life meaning and purpose? Um, and it, the reason when I'm rethinking and I'm, I'm stumbling because I'm, I'm trying to articulate this, mm -hmm. there's a way in which what Desmond, so if I can jump a little bit, Desmond will talk about ethoi, like the ethos. Mm -hmm. And he'll say that every era reconfigures its ethos and it resets its commitments, its values, and its practices. Great. Each, beneath every ethos for Desmond, there is the primordial ethos, the ethos of creation. Creation is given by an, a loving creator. I wonder if what we often regard as, but whether we call, let's call it disenchantment, that has made us look askance at, or look again at our, our own ethos and say, is it really bereft of God? Is it bereft of the spirit? I think even the notion of, of disenchantment can be a provocation to look deeper and to, add, and to, to probe beneath the, the denuded soil of our current ethos to try to return to what really, if Desmond is right metaphysically, is the true secular, the true order. And, and that's why I'm trying to, I, I, it's, it's hard for me to express that, mm -hmm. but I wonder if, if even secular, what we, you know, we consider like an atheistic society is itself, if Desmond is right, it's parasitic on, you know, it's, it's a mutant version of the, of the true secular as given by God as the creator. I'm sorry to do that to you because you're asking a question that should be more easily and succinctly answered, but it's, it's just enkindled in my mind a different way of thinking about this. Mm, okay. So it seems that that question, that, that answer, so you have the true secular, which is given by God and related back to God. And then you have, a, as you say, sort of a mutated version um, of secularity, which, which we find today. So it seems that that question comes back to faith. So to have faith is to potentially in the in the yeah as you know as you as you know it's very difficult to explain this very difficult to articulate this but in that in that God given secularity which you're on about faith is the the story of the prodigal son one could say it's the return to the embrace to the warmth whereas in the other secular form of secularity what exactly is it right it's very difficult um, am, am I on the right lines there I know I think that's brilliant and it's a very helpful image to use. You know, the prodigal sons, go, he goes out into the, the Korah Makra, the great emptiness, the great beyond. And it's only this sense, this is coming to himself. Oh, wait, I can return. And his, and his return, you know, part of the beauty of that story is that the return itself is a conversion. I mean, there's the, the first conversion. I will go back to my father's house. And then he rehearses the whole way back. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Uh, let's re let's 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 redefine our relationship based on my expectations of unsunning myself. But the return, the, the celebration, is a celebration of the impotence of the son to control the father. That the father is saying, "You cannot unsun yourself. That is not within your power to do. I welcome you back on my terms. Mm -hmm. So be refreshed." be restored. Let us celebrate. I mean, it's Eucharist right there. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a lavish display of charity. And I, I'm working on a, on a paper right now about Jesus's parables. And so I, I'm grateful that you've brought this up is <coughs> I'm calling it the treason of charity. And the, tr I, I, I see treason as an important word 
because it, it, it for the prodigal son, for the, the son who's wandered off, he is betrayed by charity in a sense because his plan, the way he is conceived of the world, is undercut and, and uh, subverted by the father. And that is what Jesus's parables seem to do all the time. They introduce an overabundant agapeic love that overrides our expectations and subverts our expectations and breaks us into an order or an economy that is not of our imagination. It, it goes beyond. It's hyperbolic to our expectations. And it introduces us to a new way of life. How do we live as if we were always welcomed by the Father? Who's it, it, abundant love, the Father who's always been waiting, the Father who's always forgiving, the Father who's always moving us back into that embrace. And I think that's, it's, it's almost too good to be true. And it's no wonder, I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't offer a syllogism or a proof of it. You would have to tell it as a story that stuck in someone's imagination and had to be ruminated on, meditated on, allowing it slowly to transform one's life. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is, the, this is a conversation which um, I got into just two days ago when we were talking, I was talking with someone about the, the work of the writer Orestes Brownson, who's an American, American Catholic writer. Um, but ultimately the conversation got to, uh, well, Orestes' conversation got to an impasse where it's almost as if there's two languages in the world. You know, there's one of those who are believers and there's one of those who are atheist or secular. And... This is really what we're talking about here is this impossibility, this gulf in between these two languages, which seem like they're all speaking the same languages up to an exact point when you mention God or belief, right? And the, 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 the impossibility of ever being able to cohere the two. And perhaps it's a really big question to ask you, but where do you think we can begin to um, meet those two languages, to have those two languages meet on? Is there a common ground? I, I think there is. You know, I just, I, you know, I finished yesterday The Soul of the World by Roger Scruton. And I loved it. I loved it. And he will talk about, I, th I think the risk religious believers and, and even ardent non-believers or those either hostile atheists, agnostics, whatever, or the indifferent, is that they can think that we, that theologians or religious practitioners or the faithful occupy two different ontological realms, the realm of science, the realm of belief. And Scruton says, no, that's not the case, that it's, it is one ontological order, but there's a cognitive dualism, that, that there's the, the physical world, and out of that emerges a world where we have humans who can raise the question of ultimate meaning, the question of purpose and goals and ends, you know, and it's at, at this, I mean, this cognitive dualism, you could ask uh, this emergence toward self-reflection and, and a meditative contemplative stance, even, even something like Nagel in Mind and Cosmos raises that. Is there a form of natural teleology, which, you know, raised hackles among many? What happens then is on that emergent level, it's not that we have two ontologic realms. We have one realm be held differently, be held with the eyes of faith. <coughs> Here it would be that, you know, I, I think the theologian can be an excellent physicist or an excellent chemist. And it doesn't, it's not a threat at all. You know, you could be a, a thoroughgoing, Dar, uh, to a degree, you know, thoroughgoing Darwinian. But you see a depth. You can see either intimations of, God or grace or providence, however you want to put that, but that there's a, a depth available. Um, the, the religious believer sees more and not less, beholds differently. And I think that's, I, I, I wonder if that isn't the first way of, of, of talking about how do we experience phenomena? And that's in your vault bazaar. Uh, would be how the, the, the beautiful as an avenue toward coming to know the creator. And, and you get it in Balthazar, you get it in Athanasius as well. Uh, you get it in the Book of Wisdom, you get it in Proverbs, you get that, that beauty is a conduit 
to encounter. But that's, it, it moves us, we have to move away from kind of an instrumental mentality to one of a more theoretical or contemplative stance. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. I mean, and this brings us really to um, the work of William Desmond. You know, this first thing which really took my interest, well, one of the many things which took my interest in your book. So this this idea, you know, you're, you're speaking of people who can you know, be chemists or be scientists or be whatever. Um, that identity as a an earthly, earthly identity sort of overtakes their being. And they're no longer a, as you say, a con contemplative um, being in it within the world. And Desmond sort of says you're taking being for granted and this seems to be a foundational error i don't want to say error actually a foundational missing of the mark of existence um in which the very foundation which allows you to be in itself is completely taken for granted and then therefore the earthly identity itself takes precedence and so where does desmond take this line of thought well you're right. Desmond would, reckon, would regard our era as one that takes being for granted. It just, well, being is just there, kind of like Copleston in his argument, uh, Russell in his argument with Copleston. Desmond, by contrast, wants to see the world as granted, as the issuance of the agapeic creator. And it is this, it's, it's a small transition for granted, as granted, that makes an enormous difference. And there's a, po so it, what we're getting in Desmond is a, yes, a metaphysics, but a distinctively poetic poesis that's a making that is helping to reawaken within the reader who reads meditatively or contemplative, contemplatively, a sense of this deep process of creation. And that, you, you know, like the physicist has no interest in creation. Mm -hmm. It's not a question for physics or for chemistry. They work on what is. Mm -hmm. The metaphysician goes back to why is it at all? And it's in raising that type of question and probing the, the nature of being, the, 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 the dynamic event of becoming, of coming to be, of passing away, that, that we don't come upon this God-shaped hole and say, oh, so this is where the divine is. We begin to find in the absolute fragility of everything, the caducity of every existent being, in its non-necessity, something that bespeaks gratuity and givenness, or what I barbar barbarously say, givingness of the creator, so that all is gift. But this is, it's an insight you could take from, I think the, I think of Hopkins to be sure, uh, and he's quoted in the book, and Denise Levertov, most especially, that, that poem, Primary Wonder. Days pass when I forget the mystery, and then the mystery announces itself. It reveals and manifests itself to the harried mind, and one is rocked back in astonishment, and the, the response isn't let me master it, let me measure it. It is instead, hallowed one, creator, Lord, that you sustain it. You know, it's this remarkable transformation in Petrarchan sonnet uh, that Levitoff writes that, that we find sprawling and sprawling and explicated in ex, you know, painful detail in Desmond. But it's this transition from for granted to as granted and the, and, and the consequences of that. And as granted, sort of, um, sorry to spring a probably quite a, a dense philosophical question on you here, but as granted uh, connects up with this ontological idea of in the midst, which actually now thinking of it sounds very akin to Heidegger's throne, you know, thrown into the world and you're, you're just thrown into this ontological sort of problem in a way. And perhaps that would be of interest just to pry out the differences between those two modes of perception. Um, what is it to be in the midst, and how? Do, um, and if if you'd go so far, how does it differ from uh, Heidegger's throne? Geborgenheit, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I will. I will say I'm no expert on Heidegger, but I'll make a stab at it in a moment. For when we when Desmond is talking about the metaxu, which he's taking from from Plato, in particular the Symposium, he's talking about a between state, and the between state in, 
here is not not exclusively an existential thrown in the middle that's it i just find myself like dante's you know uh at the beginning of of, of the inferno you know he, he wakes up in the middle of the road okay now that's part of it but then the text for desmond is between the finite the infinite between birth and death being and becoming that we are where we stand is always at the kind of the convergence of uh, of dynamisms or you know uh, movement and life uh, between you know especially between being and nothingness mm -hmm. that anything is at all and that it could not be that is what he when he gets to the met metaxu he wants us to be aware of that we're in this dynamic space where there's so much happening around us and so in, in that way it's more i think it's more robust than than heidegger i don't think i don't think heidegger has much time for a notion of creation whereas desmond certainly does it's a creation metaphysics uh a, a form of participation metaphysics if you look, you know if you think in, in terms of thomas aquinas but it, like the the musical note that is sustained by a musician that passes between the musician and the hearer mm -hmm. that it, it precariously held in existence gratuitous beautiful ever so fragile that's that but there's there's something that's the kind of the the, the texture that musical poetic quality that Desmond brings out in the Metaxu, but he wants it to be a logos of, of the between, of how do we intermediate with other beings, so profoundly relational, um, <coughs> to be is to be with others, so it, Heidegger's mit sign, but it's here a much more robust form of togetherness, because it's together with other creatures and with the creator, so the, there's a, I think, a ontological thickness to it, uh, with deep metaphysical, I mean, that's profoundly metaphysical. And so this sort of in-between us, this space where, as you say, the note, um, the note is held for both the, the, the player and the, and the, and the, and the hearer, uh, this metaxu, this foundational metaxu in a way, is this for you where the notion of exercises would come in this sort of space, which one can, it's difficult to say one can't exactly grasp it, you know, empirically speaking, but it's, it's the space within which spiritual exercises are communicating with and communicating from exactly i think so i don't know if your viewers will or if they if your audience is always viewers or listeners um if, if, if they see the video i i'm not a big guy but when i you i am my i'm now 27 years a weight watcher mm -hmm. and so i was on a diet i was a big kid i was a heavy kid when at, at a certain stage of weight loss, what someone says to himself or herself, oh, okay, I've had enough. I think things can get better. I, I have a, a sense that there's another way to be. And so one sets out and begins life changes, change of diet and certainly a, 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 the adoption of forms of exercise. And over time, the way one is in the world is fundamentally transformed. How one relates to food, how one relates to fitness and health, all changed. And the only way to, to experience that is by undertaking it. it you know, I, I, I nev I'm never surprised when students read Thomas Aquinas's Five Ways, they, because they read them like we read any, like a recipe. Well, that doesn't convince me at all. Therefore, it doesn't work. And you say, well, wait, wait, wait. Let's use our imaginations. This ties back into my Ignatian heritage, my Jesuit formation. Can we use our imaginations to enter more deeply into the argument? Instead of trying to get Aquinas proving, let us allow Aquinas to probe the created order and ask what, what those probings uncover and that I, and I think that's trying to capacitate people to invite them to expand their imaginations philosophically and then theologically 
uh, it gives us, again, not, uh, it does not bring us to a different ontological order. This is not running for, you can never depart the metaxu, but what you can do is develop a cognitional approach or a, an attunement might be a better way to say it, that is aware of being in the between, that uh, makes us sensitive to the dynamism of the created order. And not only permits us to recognize it, to say, ah, I do see that there's something here, but to respond to it. So there's, there's uh, metaphysics is a vocation. There's a vocational element that's inescapable. If you do it, I think if you do it, if you do it properly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many meta, you know, metaphysicians had their own form of vocation or their own form of practice. But I, I guess in the history of philosophy, it became a very personal thing, which they uh, were reluctant to sort of note down for others to to engage with it on, in any collective sense. I mean, it was a big question that I put in here, and it, it is extremely vague, but this form of um, vocation of practice, if you will, do you think Christianity as a religion is something which manages, or perhaps in the, in in the way that the the word the word came down, for instance, manages to inherently tie theory and practice? You know, the the theory itself, uh, as you say, with allowing the imagination to to get into the question, allows the theory to quite literally be praxis in itself. I think at its best, it does. I worry. You know, there's a there's a big push against oh we have to go back and you know reconvert the nuns or reconvert the fallen away but it always strikes me so much of our you know it, again I, te I teach at the university level and i know university professors theologians who would there are some who think we just have to teach them the catechism or we just have to teach them information no, i think that's wrong-headed I think there's a lot you can be informed about, know about, and ideally believers do know a lot about. I mean, we have to be informed, but we also have to be formed. And that's what's, what is lacking. And I think intellectually within Christianity, we err when we, we, we reduce things to easy sound bites or slogans, and we don't invite people to put skin in the game and practice what we preach and what we teach that it, it's no wonder. I, I don't think people leave Christianity because um, it's intellectually incoherent. I think that they leave because it's never asked them to do anything. We're told, you know, we, we get preached at, do we get invited? Do we get challenged to think what this means for us? I, if I can just, I'm, I'm teaching this right now. I, my, my friends are, think this is nuts. I'm teaching Mary Clark's The One and the Many. A, chem, a contemporary to mystic metaphysics. I have got a, a class. We're doing horror movies. It's really it's a, basically the theology of horror. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're taking Nori's book because it's 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 more accessible than than William Desmond's work, but it's a it's a good cousin. And what we're doing is we're building up the foundational framework of a world of of, of a metaphysical worldview. And we're kicking it against horror films to ask, how does horror work to exploit that kind of, what, what kind of metaphysical world picture does horror exploit? Mm -hmm. And then what does it do? Mm -hmm. How does it call people to action? How do we see in horror action? What does that tell us about how we should live our lives as informed, metaphysically informed Christians? Mm -hmm. And like I'm, I'm sitting here. <laughs> we had class last night. I'm, I'm reading their, their weekly essays, and it's remarkable mm -hmm. because they're seeing where theory and practice come together, where the word of metaphysics and the texture of life meet and are transformed. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, so I, I think it's our big failure. I think, and I, I hold myself responsible too for this. I don't think we, we invite enough. I think we're, we're, we, we can be too content with, well, there are people in the pews, but how are we sending them forward? It's not incidental that, you know, Christianity was first called the way. Mm -hmm. Well, and that I'm, we uh, need to recover. I'm personally extremely interested in the philosophy of horror. Uh, so is there any chance I could ask you for, perhaps for an example from, from, a, from a film of, 
of the way in which um, that is, you know, that is uh, uh, theorized and shown and the practice is shown. Oh, yeah, sure. So what we're doing is uh, Netflix's Midnight Mass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Seven episodes, it, it actually worked perfectly seven weeks before the midterms, so each one episode a week. And you, this is from Doug Cowan, uh, The Metataxis of Horror. And what you get in, if you take Midnight Mass, it's a very slow build. And you get the normal operating structure of life. What is life like on Crockett Island? And then once you have that, that stable sense, all of a sudden you, you get these, it was like Lovecraft said, the scratchings on, the, on the, the rim of the universe of something seems to be intruding. Something is not quite right. And there's this breaking in, and we can we can put that in terms of sociophobics. What are we culturally conditioned to be afraid of and to respond to with you know revulsion or disgust? Um, principles of you know principle of non contradiction. The figure in the coat either is or isn't Monsignor Pruitt. Um, you know they're on the beach. Is it is uh, Monsignor Pruitt? Does his telos change? Does the transformation change? Does it give him, does it change his essence? Is it a substantial change or an accidental change? Does it change his essence, a different telos because of that? And that's, it, you know, it's a slow build. These are students who have, many of whom have one philosophy course and love theology, but building them up this way and trying to see what, how, how does a good horror film exploit our metaphysical, you know, presuppositions. Does it, you know, insinuate itself into and begin to burrow and dig a hole through and then, you know, cause tremendous violence to the way of, the way we see the world. Mm, okay. Well, yeah, I, I'm probably going to bring in quite a lot here because this is, a, this is really exciting for me. I mean, so one of the, one of the, uh, the key tenets of any good horror film and perhaps, perhaps maybe you'll agree or disagree um, is the, the implication that the the horrifying thing, whatever it may be, has to remain hidden in some sense, right? Once the monster is revealed, it's like, all right, well, we know it's the big scary thing now, so it's not really, right? So once, as, as you, you know, cited Lovecraft, once the scratches have sort of come through and you see the thing, well, it's like, well, it was the scratching, which was the, the, the horrifying thing. And I'm thinking here of uh, Levinas, of the, the Ilya, of the there is, you know, this, this intrusive, intuitive, almost internal thing which is transcendentally knocking on the door so in horror do we see the inverse of um i'm trying to think how it might be phrased in a religious context but the you know the i can't remember who said it but the in horror we see the inverse of the lord tapping on your shoulder and saying you know come back yeah i think that's exactly right it's like the photographic negative mm. the so if you take like no carol no carol when he talks about onset that the, the, the opening sequence of Jaws. Mm -hmm. Chrissy goes down into the water. There's a great sociophobic damsel, quasi, you know, she goes off in the water. Uh, you see her from below. And it's what we cannot see that terrifies us and what literally captivates her and kills her. And it's that, that, that unseen force. And it takes us a while before we see Jaws. We get a sense of what Jaws is, but we don't, it's a dramatic reveal that doesn't make i don't think jaws any uh, more or less horrifying i think you know babies in bathtubs know the sound of dum 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 <laughs> dum dum, dum, dum. <laughs> we do that to these kids uh but the onset of the monster always you know it's a uh, robert woods normality is threatened by the monster and the monster's eruption into your milieu threatens to disrupt it entirely. Well, the way that my teaching partner, Connor Kelly, and I approach this is when we teach first year students that the onset of the incarnation disrupts the horror story that we have been living in, a horror story defined by sin. That Jesus, that, that the disruption caused by the incarnation by Jesus's words and deeds are revealing how bad things actually are. It's sort of like the upside down in Stranger Things. 
And Jesus comes to show us we've been living in the upside down all along. And he's trying to, you know, look, and we're indeed, let me show you what it could be like if you were to move into the right side up, into the real world, the world as it was intended to be, the kingdom. And I, I it doesn't captivate all students' imaginations by any means, but I do get some pretty good traction with this. Uh, because I think they, they intuitively... Horror is such a popular genre among young adults that even those who are unchurched do have a sense of this, what I've taken to call the dark transcendent, breaking into the world. And my goal is to use that phenomenon of the dark transcendence ingress into our world that disrupts it to start <laughs> to tease out and almost by working backwards well, then what type of world does the horror film pr presume about us? Like, what, what theological premises must be at play for this to, to actually work? Uh, yeah. It's a very, I mean, it's a very peculiar form of practice, and it actually brings me to a later question. I mean, do you, do you see in that dark transcendence within uh, the, the, the philosophy, the theology of horror, if you like, Desmond's return to zero, right? So in horror, you are returning to the absolute, terminal point of nihilism as to be able to have that secularity we spoke about before you finally reach the the complete below and now and th from that you then head back towards revelation well exactly it, there's it, it's it, it's a painful purging you know it's the dark night of the soul that that i think some spiritual practitioners and ascetics would would know as the, the that winnowing away that takes place in the in seclusion of a cell with the return to zero can take place in the the absolute breakdown of one's life um, jerome miller will talk about it in terms of suicide the suicide of a loved one could i have could i have done more could i have said something more absolute collapse and then maybe just maybe looking up we are awakened again, that there's a sense of, of the more. And it's not, to, it's not to glorify suffering or pain, but it is to acknowledge that it's in those experiences of utter collapse and breakthrough that the impulse to move forward, to, to, to spy and move toward a, goal, a new goal, of the of revealed goal, uh, and a, a, a goal's epiphany that has made itself manifest to us. And I think that we see that in horror, I mean, how often are the, the, the heroes in, are in a horror film unlikely and they are called into it when everything around them is, it collapses, when they should, it seems, just give up and accept death, they fight back. Now, you could say, is it just to preserve themselves? Is it to, for some cosmic good? I think that varies by film. But there's an impulse, this canatus ascendi, this grasping at life, this insistence on continuing to live that is very much present in horror. I mean, that's, <laughs> they're not just, usually they're not just sheep to the slaughter. It's, yeah, we could talk about <laughs> contemporary horror films. Uh, mm. That's not necessarily true. Uh, but the Kanatis Ascendi, you know, like this, I, I, I want to persevere, I want to live. I think a metaphysically attuned version of that or one theologically driven says, for what am I living? For what am I persevering? What is my goal? What is my purpose? And I think that I think that, that you can tease out elements of that from from different films. So it's, you would say that theoretically speaking, nihilism is defeated at the point where someone doesn't just lay down and die, right? For for them to will themselves to say, actually, well, I I really want to survive this, even even if it is in relation to some form of terror. The fact that there is something which says, no, 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 I don't want that. Whatever that is, I don't want it. Is sort of a complete negation of the meaninglessness of all things. Yeah, in that way that ni then I think Desmond puts it like the Nile annihilates itself. <laughs> I like that. Nile annihilates Nile. <laughs> which I, okay. Um, but yeah, and you, it, it, you know, it, I, I was reading Blondell in, in the early mornings and, you know, even the will, the will wills more than it, it it intends there's always more it's a calculus that there's always that that area beneath the curve that you can't quite calculate but the will never gets it never attains exactly what it's aiming toward 
there's always a surplus or an overdeterministy. And even the human will to continue. I mean, it's a powerful force. No, there's not to say that we don't, I mean, where do we see, you know, you look at Victor Frankl's experiences in the concentration camp when people's will has been broken, you know, that there is nothing left. I mean, that's, that, that's where the Nihil wins when it has vanquished even the will, to, you know, it has so frustrated the will to continue. And that's what I wonder sometimes. Like, I think, I, I think the, before we started taping today, like when we think of like the, the stress of the, uh, the 24 hour news cycle, the ongoing like atmosphere of anxiety that's become our, I think worldwide mood, we're always anxious. We're always, we feel like we're under threat all the time. It's, it's not surprising that anxiety and depression has skyrocketed, isolation and loneliness skyrocketed. I mean, this is um, like we're just being beaten down. People are just beaten down all the time. So do you, do you think this, this form of spiritual exercise in relation to what we've been talking about with horror is really what all spirit, spiritual exercises are in miniature? They're sort of this uh, miniature return to zero where something in you has to collapse for something else to grow. And you have to take this space and really have this sort of, you know, even if it's just a 15 minute contemplation, that in itself is a, is a means, a communication to have this small collapse of maybe one part of your ego, of the way you see things or something like that. I think that's really well put. Um, I think every spiritual exercise retunes us to the existence of a horizon that we cannot in our concepts or categories comprehend. And that is, you know, we have a drive to control and we, we want to impose our order on the world around us. And I think it's, and it's a sensible drive, of course. I mean, instrumental reason uh, works, but I think uh, an appropriately done spiritual exercise helps us to see the more, the, the edges of the horizon. It refreshes our sense of the, you know, of the infinite. And I, I, I will say like, that's certainly why I'm attracted to metaphysical thinkers, but why I, I appreciate say the epistemology um, or the metaphysics of knowledge of someone like Karl Rahner with every, uh, with every judgment, I move beyond that, which is judged to always moving the foregriff. I, I apprehend and I affirm the object, but then I affirm the, simultaneously the infinite horizon beyond it. And the mind is always drawn restlessly toward that horizon. Um, <clears throat> I think, yeah, it, it's, it's underappreciated. How even, yeah, I think you're right, like 15 minutes. Even, I would just say, to be concrete, if, if listeners wanted to go to a, the website, like Pray As You Go, mm-hmm. and download the exam. I tell people all the time, do the, do it for two weeks, do the exam every day for two weeks and see what the result is. Because the exam is asking you to take a step back from the regular flow of your, of your day and put it against a larger horizon. And we start to build perspective and we start to see the world differently. We see our responses to the world differently. And I think that that can't be underappreciated. We need those types of practices. So there is a return to zero in the exam. I have to, I have to allow that. I was a real jerk today and it's humbling. And then I have to ask, Lord, help me to do better. Help me to see my colleague with eyes of love. Help me to see them not as an enemy or a rival, but as a colleague and maybe one day a friend. That's really hard, but there's, there's a small part of something that gets killed off, not to be too violent, soft an edge that is softened and a new horizon a new vista exposed so that that, that spiritual exercise is uh, it, it can be practiced in in minutes a day but the cumulative effect like any exercise is is seen in the long run what do you what do you think theology would be without such exercises would you just think it would cease to really be theology Oh, it'd just be an abstract. It'd be fantasy. Mm-hmm. It'd be fa- it'd be logic puzzles. Can we make it work? It'd be like speculating over, you know, uh, Galadriel in 
the Chronicles of Narnia. It, 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 if it doesn't invite practice, it's window dressing. Intellectually interesting, maybe the stuff for a, a book, but it's not a way of, it's not a credible way of life. And I, the, and I am not dismissing by any stretch of the imagination. As you can see behind me, there are lots of books, lots of books, lots of good research. But all of them, I, at, at the end of the day, are reflections on experience, on the credibility of, well, not all of them, but many of them on the, the credibility of faith and the struggle to believe. So it, I think it has to translate into, it has to find some hook hold into the world, into the, in, in, into one's life and world. Otherwise, it just slips off into nothing. And what I guess then the question would be, especially in relation, as we've been mentioning the, the, the modern world, what do you, do you think a self is which has completely denied any horizon which you, you do the exercises to, to sort of get closer to? You know, any transcendence where... You feel that certain thing and you understand that certain exercise is going to allow you to hear something louder or get closer to it. What is the self which completely has drawn a line under it and said, no, 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 you know, the physical is is everything. And that's all I want to tailor myself towards. And that really has embedded itself in their their understanding of all things. Yeah, it's hard for me to imagine, um, <laughs> to be honest with you, because it's. It, I think it would be very lonely. And <laughs> I don't see what the source of hope would be. Where, what is, where does one find confidence? Is it only going to be in the, the, the obviously clear and steady march of science towards perfection? I don't think that's going to be it. Um, I think even a person is going to have to question it would, conf, confidence, confides, with faith. Where does that come from? In what, in what do you put your trust? I, 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 and I think that's, for a significant portion of the students I teach, that's part of it. In, in whom can they trust? And I admit, the, the, their churches have not proven trustworthy. Their governments have not proven trustworthy. The administrations of their university have not proven trustworthy. You know, our first year students at Marquette have lived just about 13 or 14% of their lives under pandemic circumstances. I have never seen the faces. I have 180 students in my class, in one class. I've not seen the faces of about 175 of them. I don't know what they look like. Mm. Their, their level to, to, to trust and to interact, it is no wonder that you know, we, we live our lives meet with reality mediated through screens and we talk to people behind masks, that we're in, enclosed and cramped. Not surprising, not surprising at all. And I never, I, it, I wear this all the time at, when I teach. I don't ever tell students that we're going to pray in class, but I will do examines with them and walk them through the stages. And we can talk about, we did a, one is, is if we were on our deathbed the other day. Mm -hmm. But to raise the question, your, what is your ultimate meaning and purpose? What, what gives you purpose, your telos, your ultimate concern? And for, for them, I think it's it's wrestling with that question, and I you know I and neither of us knows maybe in ten years we'll be hardened, having lost a sense of the transcendent to the divine. I mean, and I can see it happening. Mm -hmm. I can definitely see that happening, of being totally buffered, totally clogged. But it's the spiritual practices that I I think keep me open and keep me porous to a sense of Congress with the divine. And all I can ever do is say to, to my friends who are students who are hardened against it or uninterested at the moment, just try it and see if this experience, if, 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 if the experience helps your life, does it uncover a deeper texture or let you rethink things in a new way and see, and you know, and, and see if it gives a better account of your life. So if, in, instead of trying to prove that they have to do this, you invite and say, does it help you? Yeah. Do you mind if I ask what, uh, have you made much headway in your own personal, you know, what is the purpose? 
for yourself? <coughs> you know, I think about this a, a lot. You know, it's, it, it, Tuesday night's reading was, um, who do you say that I am? I'm a Catholic. I am, I am, a, I am a Christian. I'm a, I'm a Catholic priest. And some days I can answer that question and I can, in my mind, see Jesus before me and say, some days, old friend, I know who you are. Mm -hmm. And other days, I'm not sure that, it's, that you're even there at all. Some days I hear you very clearly in what, what you've asked me to do. Other days I wonder, are you really, is, like Flannery O'Connor, like that Christ figure who plays and hides behind the trees, are you calling me into the forest? I don't know. And there's discernment. I and I am grateful of being a Jesuit. I have a support structure that helps me to clarify and refine where I'm being called, where I'm being, where I've been asked to use my gifts and talents uh, to support God's kingdom. I get I like right now. I I think it is to be a pastoral presence to the students here at Marquette University, as their teacher, as a spiritual mentor and guide when I'm privileged to do so. But I don't know that there's, I've, I don't have one overarching vision of what I have to be or have to do. And maybe if you did, I'd, be a, I'd become a terrorist. Because then I would stop at nothing to accomplish that. Mm. But I think it's always revealed slowly, incrementally, or to the extent that I have opened myself to receive that vision. You know, I... Yeah, I think I, I don't know if that helps. I, no, it does. I mean, I think, as you say, if it was revealed all at once, you'd enter into nothing but a sort of temporal panic to to somehow achieve it, which is not really what that would almost be at that point, a re, you know, a revealing of the future. And you think, well, I've got, you know, somehow I've got to end up there, which would be a real. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, how often, you know, I, I'll tell you, if you would have said 10 years ago, I was, so I, I was finishing, t in 2012, I finished teaching in Detroit. And if you would have said, now, you know, right in a decade, you'll be going up for tenure at Marquette University. I would have guffawed. It was, it'd been inconceivable. This is not how I, I would have anticipated 10 years ago, my life would have gone. If you would have said, oh, and you'll be teaching a class on horror, you'll be teaching a big class on the foundations of theology, you'll be working on a book on horror, and you'll have taught a class on contemplation and racism. And I would have said that you'd write a book on, on William Desmond. I would have said, I've never heard of him. I can't write a book on someone I don't know. But looking back, I could say, oh, I see how this all came together. Mm. That like a sort of quasi life examine, looking back on my experiences in life, I say, I don't think it was random. And I can, with, gratitude say lord i do see the way you've led me through this even when i struggled but thank you mm. like I, I have nothing but gratitude for the life i've lived regret over certain things but at, at the heart of a deep gratitude yeah and that gives me trust and confidence well i i have to agree because if you were to uh tell uh 17 year old me 17 year old christopher hitchens reading me that i was going to uh you know sympathetically in 10 years time uh, interview a Jesuit priest and be looking forward to it as well. Um, you know, that that is completely, quite literally what miles apart. But as you say, you look over that time and you, you realize the small, the small little changes to the track, which allowed you to eventually end up where you are. Mm. Yeah, it's amazing. It is. It's astounding. Um, is there anything you'd like to add about your <coughs> book? I mean, we haven't really delved into all the, the depth of your book, but... Um, you know, it, it's a very affirmatively dense book in a really great way. And it's a great, you know, for anyone interested in William Desmond, um, it's a really great text. Um, but yeah, is there anything you'd like to add um, about it that we haven't really touched on? I mean, obviously, there's, as I say, there's tons more in there. <laughs> but yeah, and I, you know, it, it's a hard book to talk about because it's not just one idea worked out ad nauseum. It was a weird dissertation mm -hmm. in that, I sat down and wrote it. Okay, <laughs> okay, of course I sat down and wrote it. I, it. But I started on page one, and then I I just kept going. And it flowed. I 
I began writing it on July 14th, 2017, uh, and I finished it December 15th, 2017. And so I wrote the project in five months. And I would send a chapter a month to my advisor and he'd get it back to me very quickly. And it, when I did the defense, Richard Kearney laughed. And he said, did you write, he said, did you just write it and keep going, you just one chapter after another, which I did. He said, it reads that way. It's, a, it's almost a story. Or I'd like to think of it as kind of a story that does hang together. It has its internal consistencies. So the one thing I would say is for anyone who reads it, I apologize. I think the, <laughs> I think the, I think William's foreword is helpful. I think the introduction and conclusion uh, give you a sense of the, the terrain that it follows. The second chapter for me was the most important one to write because it, it, it was the chapter that tried to give a synoptic sense of what William is doing. William is a, William is an amazing writer, but he's difficult. He's very dense. And if I could help translate him in a way that would help others, and you know, I'm, I'm, to that extent, I'm, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And I've gotten, it's been heartening to hear that, it's, that people have liked the book and, and found it helpful. Then I can just say that my next one will be much more accessibly written. <laughs> it's the goal at least is to write for, for, for an educated audience, but for not for specialists. Cause I don't think the questions we try, I try to raise here are for specialists, but um, unavoidably, unavoidably dense in this form. But I think there's there's ways that they can be uh, made more accessible, more porous to the inquisitive mind. And I'm assuming we can, we can find it on the Notre Dame website and also I think Amazon as well. Correct. Correct. Mm. So are you are you already working on these books now? <clears throat> I am I am eye deep in research, hmm. and it, you know it's a funny thing because there's no if you can look you can Google it Google Scholar theology of horror. It doesn't really exist, and there are people who think that it's a stupid research project because it's oh horror is silly. I don't think so. I think it's I think it's cultural relevance provides us an opening to really think critically about doing theology in our era and th th that's something we have to take seriously how do you how do we talk about faith and grace and the authority of scripture and revelation and tradition in an era when that's th th those are foreign concepts so you have to almost retranslate it in an idiom that is understood and that's my hope at least to try to do that but we'll see. We'll see. So it's a lot of horror theory. And it's so much horror. I don't know. Do you read a lot of horror theory? Like the uh, fair amount, yeah. yeah. I I find a lot of it just reductive and somewhat silly. It all comes I mean, in most cases it comes down to sex. I think horror is much more interesting than than, than Freud and sex. Uh well it's it's um it, at base it's ontological or, or... I don't want to say existential because I think that cheapens it. I think it's more, it's more than that. I mean, that's where, and that's where Lovecraft gets it so right. You know, cosmic horror, the idea of an absolute um, foundational shift to not just an existential question of meaning, but a, the meaning of meaning. <laughs> yes. Yes. The, uh, in, in, when they're in this, the issue, right? I mean, it's that the world, the ontic order that we understand is under threat. Mm. And it, it when it, it it's easy, and I and I appreciate a lot of the stuff I, I've read. I just don't find it all that helpful, because it's it, it just seems to move in. Of course, Freud is right, so it's going to follow this Freudian train. I just I don't know that I buy the premises, and I've been looking. I think there's I think a metaphysical approach is more interesting, mm -hmm. and satis intellectually satisfying, and within my realm of comprehension, <laughs> my abilities. So is, is is that is the course that you are you going to study, uh, teach more courses on on theology and horror? I think so. I this this is a pilot. I'm just trying to see if it works mm -hmm. to teach metaphysics to to college students. <laughs> I mean, I think it's working. I mean, I do think it's working. Uh, in the fall, I'm running a seminar on atheism and theism. Mm -hmm. My temptation is to teach a secular age, but Hans Joas, I'm interested in his work. And I've been doing a lot of reading 
on emotions and the affections, mm-hmm. Peter Goldie, uh, Robert Solomon, Martha Nussbaum, William James, especially. Mm-hmm. And there's just, it seems to be, there's just a lot more there than we would necessarily assume. And I, I'm, I don't know. I, I'm a muck about thinker. I'll just kind of muck about and figure out eventually, oh, this is how I want to go. And then just start running down the road. <laughs> Well, I, if you ever open these courses up to the public, I'd be sure to join, and I'm sure many of my listeners would probably join. Or are they, or are they uh, market market only? No, oh, well, right now they're market only. But there's always that that desire to can we make can we do something more expansive? And like this class, I, <coughs> we we will discuss the cha- we discuss the reading, we view the whatever the, the units movie is, you know, or episode. And then we discuss the episode in light of the the day's readings. It goes well. It'd be hard to, I, actually, maybe it wouldn't be all that hard to operationalize. It could be fun. Well, um, Ryan Dunn, so that seems like a great place to finish up. Um, yeah. I thoroughly enjoyed this. And um, yeah, thanks very much for coming on. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure. <laughs>